I'd mentioned the governor and the attorney general not doing their job. The attorney general or people in his office can read the law just like I read it. They understand the law just as I understand it. But having a political agenda as they have, they cannot apply the law which their training, their intelligence, and their experience will show them ought to be applied a certain way. So they sacrifice substance for form. Several of my colleagues gave me the only statement made by the governor. Governor Heinemann said, quote, this unprecedented judicial activism leaves me speechless. The statement itself is a contradiction. He had to speak to make the statement. Those are the kind of people I'm dealing with. They don't think about what they're saying. He used one sentence and got it wrong. So you know when it comes to substantive issues, he's not going to get them right. This man is such a political creature that knowing a person literally could be cooked alive could be still experiencing a heartbeat and breathing. After being roasted in the electric chair, the governor thinks that ought to go forward because he's looking at it as a politician. No matter what issue I'm dealing with on this floor, no matter who supports it or who's opposing it, I will never forget my basic humanity, even if other people are forgetting theirs and do not want to accord to me a recognition of the humanity that is possessed by all of us. I'm never going to agree that something such as what would happen with an electrocution, I will never agree that that should go forward just because judges mistakenly said it shall. I tell young people, and it's good when older people can do this, and I've had to do it, you're proceeding down a path which you may or may not think is the right one. You have an epiphany and realize that where you're going is not where you ought to be going. You should be able to stop, turn around, retrace your steps, and go the right direction. It is never too late as long as we're breathing to acknowledge an error, to stop, correct it, and do the right thing. We in public office certainly ought to be able to do that, whether we like it or not. One Our minute. job is to inform the public, be an example of what it is we say should happen. The governor said this action by the Supreme Court is unprecedented. He does not pay attention. By unprecedented, he means it hadn't happened before. But the court has, pursuant to action on my part, done something in the past, which before I persuaded them to do it, was also unprecedented. I realize this is my third time on this amendment, so I'll continue when the bill is before us or some other opportunity presents itself. Thank you, Mr. President. Legislature continuing. When I talk to young people in my community, talk to anybody, and I hope I haven't said that this this morning, but if I did, it, won't, it will bear repeating. I tell them that a loaded brain beats a loaded gun, but then when they look, I say, except in a gunfight, so they know that I'm not crazy. I say, but I have a point that I'm trying to make with you, and then I give an example. If I got five guns on me, but somebody is standing with a pistol on my nose, I can't use my guns. I can't reach them. The only thing I have going for me is what's in my head, my ability to talk, and maybe I can reason my way out of this situation. So rather than have a lot of guns with a lot of bullets, try to equip yourself so that if you have nothing other than what you carry in your brain, use that and develop it so that you can make your way through a world which often is going to be hostile. So in doing what I've tried to do in this situation with the court and to derail this execution, I couldn't go to those judges and put a gun on them and say, do what I want you to do. There is no threat I could make against them, and I wouldn't make one. I had to appeal to their intelligence, to their sense of duty, and responsibility. 
I had to use the Constitution in which they're trained, the law which directs their daily activities, and provide logical argument to tie it all together to bring them to the conclusion that I thought was valid. They agreed. But agreement doesn't always lead to the action that's required. They could very easily have taken the coward's way out as the Attorney General and the Governor did. They didn't even have to acknowledge my letter, although the Chief Justice acknowledged that it had been received, his aide did so, but I meant beyond that. They didn't have to acknowledge they read it. They could have read it and totally disregarded it. But that letter put this issue on their agenda. And these judges, in my opinion, not just because their decision agreed with what I think it should have been, in a state like Nebraska, where you have a governor of the kind you have sitting in the northern quadrant of this building, an attorney general who is political through and through, the court could have just done nothing. The court could have said nothing. Then you'd have me standing up here paraphrasing that famous comment that all that's needed for evil to triumph is that good people do nothing and the court has done nothing and join that infamous brigade. But instead, these judges did what the law, what the Constitution, what human decency demanded. And they will be criticized. The governor has started it, but they did it anyway. They, by what they did, upheld that predominating standard that governs the judiciary. Judges must be independent. They must not be swayed by the hue and cry of the public. Their decisions should not be based on a poll or a popularity contest, but on the Constitution, the law, and the requirements of justice, and that's what these judges did. Much can be learned from this. This case one would be the perfect one for a law school course. It covers everything that is involved in studying the law, becoming expert in the law, then practicing the law, to let you know that there are duties and responsibilities you have that will show why being a judge distinguishes you from every other person in this society. You're given powers that nobody else has, namely to pronounce a death sentence, to sign a death warrant, or to stay that sentence when an error has been made. So the judges are due a lot of respect and consideration, and I want to put some of it on the record. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Chambers, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the legislature, because many people will never read an actual opinion written by a court, I'm going to read a few things into the record from the court's opinion that I think are very important. The majority wrote, our constitutional responsibility to decide whether electrocution is lawful requires us to consider whether any convicted person should be electrocuted before that question is answered. This is a hard thing for anybody to do, which I'm going to read. We conclude that we acted prematurely in ordering a death warrant before resolving that constitutional question in State versus Mata. Incidentally, I'd mentioned that case in my letter. For the following reasons, we stay Moore's execution and withdraw the order of our clerk directing the warden of the Nebraska State Penitentiary to electrocute him. Continuing, had we properly considered those responsibilities at the time, we would not have ordered the issuance of a death warrant. Then speaking of this case pending before them, that case is scheduled for submission to this court in September. While we have previously concluded that electrocution is constitutional, we have also noted a changing legal landscape that raises a question regarding the continuing vitality of that conclusion. Were we to conclude 
that electrocution is no longer constitutional, then we would have undeniably permitted a cruel and unusual punishment only a few months earlier. The damage to Moore and to the integrity of the judicial process would be irreparable. It would be premature to permit this electrocution to proceed without the benefit of deciding on a developed record whether electrocution is a lawful punishment. And if we were to conclude that electrocution was cruel and unusual after Moore had been electrocuted, our citizens' confidence in this court and the rest of the judicial branch as a bastion of civil rights might suffer irreparable harm. Although we respect the defendant's autonomy, the solemn business of executing a human being cannot be subordinated to the caprice of the accused. We must adhere to our heightened obligation to ensure that the lawful and constitutional administration of the death penalty, regardless of the wishes of the defendant, in any one case, concerns for finality to the state's judgments do not outweigh the absolute need to protect against the deprivation of an individual's constitutional rights which might invalidate his capital sentence. For the foregoing reasons, we order a judge and decree that the execution of the defendant be and hereby is stayed. And the warrant of our clerk dated March 21, 2007, directing the warden of the Nebraska State Penitentiary to execute the defendant be and the same hereby is withdrawn. I think the court, as I've stated, showed fortitude, respect for its duties, and gave guidance to the rest of society how very serious public policies ought to be handled. The fact that a person makes an observation today does not mean a different observation cannot be made tomorrow if facts warrant that difference in the observation. One this minute. might be the last comment I'll make today on this matter. No, I have one more chance to speak, so I will wrap it up then. But I'll stop now. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Chambers. You are recognized to continue. Thank you. Mr. President, members of the legislature, I'm going to support, I say again, Senator Senawicki's bill. But I'm aware, keenly aware, of the kind of statements unwisely and unjustifiably which may be made against what these judges did. But even people who might support a death penalty should be able to understand why judges would not want to allow an execution to occur when there's a very real possibility that they themselves will rule that such an execution is unconstitutional. Who would ask them to do that? Look on the floor of this legislature. When we're dealing with a piece of legislation, some bills we will trust the person on and say, even though we haven't got everything we want, we'll let it move from general file to select file. But we've all seen other instances where people said, before we let this bill go, we want some things straightened out right here. And I've done that on occasion. So if in these smaller things we will say that prior to allowing a final judgment to be entered, there are other facts we need to have resolved to our satisfaction. If we do that in the smallest of things, certainly in the greatest action that can be undertaken by a court, which is to authorize the judicial execution of a citizen, the court has a responsibility to say that because serious questions attend an execution, and we, as a court, have pending before us a case in the proper posture to resolve these issues. There will be no executions until the court is satisfied that if an execution is carried out, it is justified under the Constitution and the laws, both of the country and of this state. A court would be unreasonable to do anything other than that. 
if the speechless governor, who nevertheless spoke while saying he was speechless, had to make a negative statement for his political protection, he could have made the statement say, this unprecedented judicial action leaves me speechless. That word activism is a loaded word. It is a cold word for all the loonies, for the ultra-right wingers, for those who are constantly saying the courts ought to do what the racists, what the haters think the court ought to do, and the governor is aligning himself with those people by the use of that word activism. Anytime the court takes an action, you can say that's activism if you just mean that they took some kind of action. The governor is using what is a term of art in the realm of dirty politics. And I say that he took a cheap shot and it was unworthy, not only of him as governor, but of any governor. He is miffed because his irresponsible failure to act in this case as he should have has been spotlighted by what the top court in the state has said. The governor standing there with cookie crumbs all over his face, residue of cookies on all of his little stubby fingers, cookie crumbs running down the front of his vestments, and stand on, lying on the floor are the shattered remains of a cookie jar. One minute. And he's standing there now putting his little chubby hands behind his back and they say, David, were you in the cookie jar? He raises his eyes to the sky and says, no, ma'am. She says, well, David, the facts say otherwise. It's bad enough that you went into the cookie jar, but it's worse that you lied about it. And I could catch you because all of the circumstantial is evident, evidence is there. That's the governor's position. He was caught robbing the cookie jar and he's miffed. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Friend was mentioned as the one who will speak right after me, so I want to ask him a question or two. Senator Friend, would you yield to questions from Senator Chambers? Sure. Senator Friend, we've had our differences on issues on the floor before, haven't we? Y yes. And have there been times, just be frank, when I have really irritated and annoyed you with my positions and the way I express them? Yes. Now, here's the next question. Would you... Never angered, though. Right. Just irritated if, and annoyed. Right. And maybe exasperated, vexed, and, and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. If my hands were tied behind my back, and if my legs were shackled, and I was tied to a tree, and you were given free reign to pummel me any way you chose from head to foot and all points in between, would you take advantage of that opportunity presented to you? You want me to, honestly? Yes, I do. I would untie your hands. Um, I would set you free. Thank you. And this was not planned. That's all I have. Members of the legislature, I didn't complete what I was talking about the last time. The lawyers know this. Judges are not free to respond to certain things publicly on matters that are pending. He knows that the judges cannot respond to what he said. And what he did was what Senator Friend said he would refuse to do to me. He knows that these judges are shackled. He knows they're like a punching bag, unable to strike back. So the governor, the top person in this state, takes a cheap shot. And if other people won't speak up when the judges do the right thing, I will. And if others are afraid to take the governor to task, I am not. He's just a man. And a man ain't nothing but a man. And these things need to be dealt with. So that's what I wanted to say to wrap up what I had been talking about prior to that.